Hello, this is Richard Thorne in Chapter 2 of the series, The Mayas in Georgia. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at the basically the fall and the resurrection of the Creek people during the last 300 years as a way of explaining why contemporary acclimatizations, uh, archaeologists, historians, seem to dumb down their cultural history or just be unaware of it. And in since they, when the evidence is obvious of a partial Itzamaya heritage to the Creek people, they ignore it and say there's no evidence. Well, let's move on. Why do academicians, even anthropologists who claim to be experts on the Muscogee Creek people, know so little about our actual cultural heritage? I'm going to run through an exercise so you'll understand what's been going on the last 150 years. This is a fairly well-known shell gorget that's found anywhere from North Georgia, West Georgia, Alabama, uh, Tennessee, across to Missouri, lower Illinois, Cahokia area that seems to originate in North Georgia or Southeastern Tennessee. My guess is it's North Georgia. Let's take a look at the details. Here we see two men wearing conical caps. Have you ever seen any museum exhibit or drawing in a book that showed the Indians of the Southeast wearing conical straw hats? Well, here you see them, no doubt about it. They're hunters. Uh, let's look at their kilts. These are not breech cloths, but kilts. Notice that, see? This is exactly the same thing that the Mayas wore. And on these are crosses. Now, these are the Maya's glyph for the planet Venus. That's very significant information because Venus was the planet which guided warfare. So we can assume these are two warriors who are now hunting. It also negates the claim that there's no evidence of a Maya writing in the southeast. Well, that's a Maya glyph. There's many more, though, but this is just one example. Okay, uh, one is wearing black face partially may look like a bird or a cat in the center we see what is not a sacred fire you see they didn't even look at the design at all the color of sacred fire this is a brazier for burning incense copal incense to be particular you can see it rising from the brazier on it is the sky snake, which is a symbol of the Isamayas. They was their most sacred deity. This seems to be two rattles that are tied together. So they have evidently, according to the core of their mythology, the copal and the ceremony tied the two peoples together. Well, in the center we see four concentric circles in a vertical row. This is typical of the Panoan people of eastern Peru. Particularly Caniva, even today they wear clothing with the linear arrangement of concentric circles. So that's a very interesting combination of multicultural symbols. On the left is a statue I photographed in Teleco Plains, Tennessee, near the Georgia North Carolina line. It's a Chisca warrior. You probably heard of the Chiscas, they're mentioned by the Spanish explorers. From probably from Satipo, the town of Satipo, visited by Hernando de Soto, which the Cherokees called Satikoa, which became Stikoa in the historic period. It's in eastern Tennessee. Notice he's wearing the conical hat, he has the black face. The images in the gorget did not have a sword and a, and a shield, but we can assume that they did that too. Now on the right, Again, this is why they, they don't do their homework, uh, even though they're PhDs and supposed to be teaching at the college level. The Chiska was a major ethnic group in eastern Tennessee. They lived in Satipo province. They wore a conical straw helmet. They had black faces. See the similarity? Uh, they had their face kind of like a cat here, and then they had something on their neck. See, this guy has something on his neck. The same thing is true for the gorget. So we have virtual proof that the 
people, the Tisca people, migrated northward into the southeastern United States and middle Mississippi Valley. But there's more. The bird clan of the Cherokees is known as the Chisqua. Now, Chisca means bird in the Pinoan languages of Peru, so there's no question about it. The survivors of the Chisca in northeastern Tennessee were absorbed into the Cherokee Alliance and they became the Bird Clan. This is a coloring of a uh, engraving made in uh, Rotterdam in 1658. It's based on the sketches of Richard Brickstock who traveled through what is now Georgia and eastern Alabama, western North Carolina in 1653 as a guest of the High King of Appalachia. And you notice these Appalachia people also wearing the conical hats, plus they're wearing clothing typical of eastern Peru. The elite lived in round houses. You see them in the large round houses. The four layer of Etowah Mounds contains these same round houses, almost 50 feet in diameter. <clears throat> so what do we have? We have artistic proof, and to a sense linguistic proof, that the Gorget portrays an alliance of the Appalachian, the Ishiti, which is what the Isamayas call themselves, and the, most of the Creeks in Georgia call themselves, and the Chiska. That's a very different picture of the past than you normally read in your state history book or in an anthropological textbook. Caucasian archaeologists and historians have consistently used the term the Creeks as if they were and are a single ethnic group. We are not a single ethnic group. Remember my story in chapter one when I was showing off to some tribal employees in Okmulgee, Oklahoma? I mentioned some names of plants and animals that my great uncles had taught me. They had never heard the words before and said I couldn't be a Creek. As it turned out, I was speaking Eastern Creek, which is spoken by the majority of, of Seminoles in Florida and the Miccosukee. So I was speaking another language, and it, and it could be well understood that would be the case because most of Seminole and definitely the Miccosukee came from Eastern and Northern Georgia or the Western North Carolina mountains. The ancestors of today's Creeks were the remnants of at least 40 ethnic groups, all of whom represented varying mixtures of other peoples. They had different languages and dialects. They had different architectural traditions. They shared enough in common with the other members of the Alliance to form the semblance of a tribe, but even today there are physical differences, perhaps as many as five, among the physiotypes of the, of the Creek people. On the left you see a list of the members of the Confederacy that we know about. This would be people who joined uh, the early 1700s, but does not include the Chickasaw, who also were members of the Creek Confederacy for a while in the early 1700s. The main map is showing the towns and provinces mentioned by the DeSoto expedition in 1540. You will learn in Chapter 3 that DNA analysis and linguistics has discovered these peoples came from many parts of the world, and not just the Americas, from Polynesia, from Southeast Asia, and from even Northern Europe. Your mind will be blown. But first, let's take a look at the history of the People of One Fire, better known as the Creek Confederacy. Our musical background for this section of the chapter will be by Frank Minnison, who is a citizen of the Creek Nation, an expert speaker, a philosopher, poet, and musician. Notice that the Muscogees were not part of the first Creek Confederacy.
The United States government took advantage of the Civil War to punish both their allies and their enemies in the aftermath, mainly to get much of their land. In the case of the Creeks, they took half of the land, even though the loyalties divided between pro-Union, pro-Confederate during the war. We're going to take a look at some of the, the treaties that were forced down the throats of the American Indians in Oklahoma after the war. Reconstruction Treaties. The Chickasaw and Choctaw signed a joint treaty on July 10, 1866. The Creek and Cherokee Treaties were proclaimed on August 11th and the Seminole Treaty on August 16th. Generally, all the treaties contained amnesty for all crimes committed against the United States prior to the treaties and included specific provisions of peace and friendship towards the United States. The terms of these treaties were more favorable to the five tribes and the offerings made by commissioners at an earlier Fort Smith, Arkansas council, which was attended by all of the Native Americans from the Oklahoma area. However, all tribes were required to free their slaves and accept freed slaves as members of their tribe. They were also to provide farmland for the freedmen families. As you may know, right now that's a issue getting public attention because their court cases where the freedmen have been deprived of their membership in the tribe and they're trying to get it back. The Creeks ceded the western half of the lands for $975,168. Some of the land was to be used for rebuilding and the remainder was to be held in trust. The Seminoles ceded all of their land to the federal government for 15 cents an acre. They then had to purchase 200,000 acres for 50 cents an acre from the government. Ironically, the government had purchased the same track of land from 30 cents an acre from the Creeks, which means the federal government made a huge profit on the deal. Uh, maybe the federal government should go into the land business more often these days. We wouldn't have to pay taxes. The Reconstruction Treaty stated that no federal legislation could interfere with or annul their tribal organization. The federal government was going to violate that clause in 20 years. Yes, white man speak with forked tongue. The 19, 1887 General Allotment Act or the Dawes Liberty Act of 1887, named after Henry L. Dawes of Massachusetts, was in direct violation of the treaties made in 1866 with the five civilized tribes. It authorized the President of the United States to subdivide Native American tribal land holdings into allotments for Native American heads of family and individuals, transferring traditional systems of land tenure into government-imposed systems of private property. Here's an example of one of the allotments to the Choctaw and the Chickasaw. The 1887 General Allotment Act forced Native Americans to assume a capitalist and proprietary relationship with the property that they did not previously exist. The act also owned up remaining Native land for appropriation by white settlers before private property could be dispensed. The government now had to determine which Indians were eligible for allotments. This is the beginning of the blood quantum clauses in constitutions and federal treaties. Prior to that time, a member of a tribe was a member of a tribe. They, particularly the southeastern tribes had no concept of race or, or skin color being directly related to whether or not you're a member of their group. It was more like a mutual commitment from both the citizen of that tribe and the other people to bond together as one people. Here's a map of of Oklahoma after the, the land thefts of the Civil War Reconstruction period, but before the allotment period. You can see that whereas before the Civil War, all of Oklahoma was Indian territory, now well over half has been taken away from the Indians with little compensation, really, and then sold to white people. But the best soils and the best land and the most rainfall were in the areas where the Indians were still owning the land. The 1898 Curtis Act was an amendment to the United States Dawes Act. It resulted in the breakup of tribal governments and the communal lands in Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. And the five civil tribes, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, Muktogee Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole. Now, make it clear, this is not a treaty. This is a law passed by Congress, which now the Indians have to obey without signing a treaty. It's just forced down the throat. At the same time, they had no right to vote. These tribes had been previously exempted from the 1887 General Allotment Act, 
because of the terms of the treaties. In total, the tribes immediately lost control of about 90 million acres of their communal lands. They lost more in subsequent years. In response, the leadership of the five tribes proposed to create a separate state composed of the territory of the five tribes and some small tribes that lived amongst them. This is pretty smart and show the sophistication. Uh, they divided up the lands into counties, erasing the, the tribal boundaries. They gave names to the counties. They did everything that's required by the federal government for creation of a state. In the lower left, you see the emblem of the new state. It has five-pointed star, of each point of the star being one of the five civilized tribes. This was to be called the State of Sequoia. The Sequoia Constitutional Convention met in Muskogee on August 21, 1905. General Pleasant Porter, Principal Chief of the Creek Nation, was elected as the President of the Convention. The Convention drafted a constitution, drew up plans of an organization of the government, put together a map showing the counties to be established, and elected delegates to go to the United States Congress petition for statehood. On December 7, 1905 voters in the territory approved the Constitution state of petition by a vote of 56,279 to 9,073. Yes, it was given to the Congress, and Congress ignored it as if it was never been handed to them. What is the real impact of the Dolls Act? Creek and Seminole communities were scattered to the wind. Creek women lost their right to vote and to hold public offices. Tribal governments were disbanded and lost almost all the funding. Light horse police, tribal law courts, and judges were abolished. Five civilized tribes were still not citizens of the United States. Creek's, Creek's principal chief appointed by the U.S. president until 1951. The Creek's principal chief appointed by the Secretary of Tier from 1951 to 1971. Basically, they had most of the civil rights taken away from them. The Indian Reorganization Act, called the Wheeler-Howard Act, from June 18, 1934, aimed at decreasing federal control of American Indian affairs and increasing the Indian self-government and responsibility. In gratitude for the Indian service to the country in World War I, Congress in 1924 authorized the Merriam Survey of American Indians. It was also that year that a amendment to the Constitution was passed, which gave citizenship to all American Indians. The shocking conditions caused by the Dawes Act in 1887 spurred demands for reform. As a result of this act, three tribal towns were recognized by the federal government in Oklahoma. The Thloploco Creek Tribal Town, which originated in Waverly, North Carolina, Waverly, Alabama, which, which formerly was called Thloploco, Alabama. The Kalagi Tribal Town, whose mother town is Watkinsville, Georgia, in Northeast Georgia. And the Alabama Quasarty Tribal Town, whose ancestors came from Southeastern Alabama. It had been, would have been possible for other tribal towns to have been created in the southeast at that time. This is something most people don't know. Uh, there were several communities isolated, generally on rivers, uh, away from the major routes of traffic, which contained almost entirely creeks. This is a fact that's left out of the Georgia State History Book and also the Atlanta, uh, excuse me, the Alabama State History Book. Of the many Creek communities in Alabama and Georgia, only one eventually became a recognized tribe. For example, uh, where my family lived in, in Rutgers Bottom and Eastern Elbert County had a large number of Creek and Uchi descendants, families that still to a certain extent practiced their traditions, although they were Christians. They probably didn't know they could form a tribe and they were so destitute from the Great Depression they probably lacked the leadership and the energy to do something about it. But at that time they could have formed a tribal town because we have proof that my family had been at the same spot there on the river since before the American Revolution. Many other families the same situation. But that did not occur 
and the opportunity was passed. The period between 1937 and 1987 was when the Southeastern Creek Indian court dockets occurred. These were special judicial procedures for the descendants of loyal United States citizens whose homes and land had been stolen by state and local courts. In chapter two, I mentioned that my extended family owned 3,000 acres in reserves that were immune to any treaties made by the Muscogee Creek Nation. They were military reserves given to those families in gratitude for their extreme service during the American Revolution, the Cherokee Chickamauga Wars, and the War of 1812. In the case of the, the residents in Northeast Georgia, uh, most of those Creeks refused to get involved in the Red Stick War and instead they volunteered for a regular army unit known as the Creek Regiment. This was not a volunteer, this is a regular army unit and it was assigned to the coast of Georgia where they fought British Rangers who were being dropped off by ships to raid plantations. You'd never read about that in your state history books either, do you? Angie Deva was a very bright and technically skilled historian in Oklahoma during the 20th century. She wrote a blockbuster book called The Road to Disappearance in 1941. The basic theme of the book is that because of the actions of the federal and state governments, the Creek people would soon be extinct as a recognizable culture. Her book is still published today. It's an excellent book and it's the best one you can find about the history of the Creek people once they arrived in Oklahoma. It's rather vague and has some errors in its description of what happened in the many centuries before them when they were in the Southeast, but the book is very important for any Creek of Seminole or Miccosukee to read to understand the politics and the history that affected today's conditions. In 1946, the U.S. government again appreciated the extreme sacrifice made by Native Americans and they created the United Indian Lands Commission. The Florida Seminoles immediately filed for a settlement to recover their lost lands in Florida, which they were given to them by treaty. All Creek communities in Georgia are, were scheduled to be inundated by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers reservoirs. These communities were located on the Savannah River, both on the upper Savannah, where my family lived, and in the lower Savannah, where it was primarily Yuchi descendants, on several locations along the Chattahoochee River, south of Columbus, on both sides of the river, were Creek Indian communities that are specifically mentioned in the U.S. Corps of Engineers report when planning these lakes. You're not told this in your state history books, are you? No. In 1954, my family was offered land in Oklahoma in lieu of land in Georgia. They declined because they didn't want to move to Oklahoma. And secondly, they didn't want their neighbors to find out that they were Indians. In the 1940s, the Creek families of Georgia joined Calvin McGee of then Creek Nation east of the Mississippi, now known as the Porch Band of Creeks in Atmore, Alabama, as a unified group or nation of Muscogee people as they sued for land payment known as Docket 21. Other dockets that follow were Docket 272 and 275. An act of Congress was passed to set regulations to determine what documents were used to determine the eligibility. The state of Georgia recognized hundreds of the descendants of the Creeks being eligible for this docket in 1966. The last docket was paid in 1987. The Creek Nation east of the Mississippi served as a formal organization representing the Muscogee Creek people for the purpose of the claim and for governing body of each community of Creeks. Now the first docket case my mother's family in was settled uh, I think around 1939 or 1940, her share of the court payment for, for settlement of damages was $38. That's compensation for about a thousand acres of land divided up among the descendants. But that was a lot more money than it is now. She used the $38 to buy, I think, two dresses and a blouse and shoes so she would have decent clothes to wear when she went off to college on a full scholarship. She was the first person in her family to be allowed to graduate from a public high school 
and graduated summa cum laude from the University of Georgia four years later. In 1953, the determination of the Seminole tribe was being proposed by the U.S. House in a resolution. When Seminoles learned the possible termination of the tribe, they worked with Rex Quinn to organize politically and to gain federal recognition. The state of Florida's politicians were very helpful in this cause. We have to hand it to Florida for that, that they really helped the Seminoles, and it would have never occurred without support of their congressional delegation. In 1957, the Seminole Constitution was ratified by a vote of 241 to 5 in Congress. The tribe gained federal status as the Seminole Tribe of Florida. The government consisted of a council and a board. Billy Asalolo was elected the first chairman. Frank Billy was elected the first tribal president. He resigned and was succeeded by Bill Osceola. I guess the same person or maybe his son. The, all of the Indians in Florida were initially under the umbrella of the Seminole tribe, but the Miccosukee, who spoke a different language and had a very different cultural tradition, immediately began pressuring to have their own tribe recognized by Congress. If you remember some of our other programs on the People of One Fire channel, the Miccosukee are the descendants of the elite of the Soki, who lived in along the Soki River Valley in northeast Georgia, and uh, Originally, they were the creators of the Olmec civilization. Then after that were participants in the Maya civilization. That's according to their own migration legend. They fled Mexico when their area of Mexico was invaded by Aztecs. We do know, though, that there were several hundred, if not well over several thousand, traditional and independent Creeks and Seminoles in Florida who refused to join either the tribe out of fear of having their land taken away from them again. They're still there in Florida. Some have organized into state-recognized Creek tribes. Others still remain deep within the, the woods and the swamps and the Everglades as anonymous bands of Indians. The Creeks rise. Now we're going to discuss plans for the Southeastern Creek Confederacy and the experience of individual Creeks and Yuchis as they discovered their heritage. A few months after turning 12 years old, I became one of the youngest Eagle Scouts ever. I was the only Native American in our scout troop, which was located in suburban Atlanta. A clique of boys who attended a nearby private school and whose fathers were wealthy airline pilots blocked me from being in the Boy Scouts Order of the Era. Normally, it would have been an automatic thing, even without being Native American, for an Eagle Scout to go into the Order of the Era, but they were vetoing me each time when I was nominated by other guys in the troop. I must say this is the only time in my life, very frankly, that I felt I was discriminated against for socioeconomic reasons. And for a long time, I didn't understand why, but we, we'll see what happened. It later turned out that our scoutmaster, an Eastern Airlines pilot, was involved in immoral relationships with these private sector, private school boys. And evidently, that little sex game clique did not want me in their chapter of the War of the Air for fear that I would find out what was going on. I was never invited to join the War of the Air, even after these facts were revealed by the media. At age 14, I was living in, in a neighborhood on the edge of Atlanta, we call the excerpts today, where there was both subdivisions and people still farming the land to a certain extent. There was an old log cabin near me that even had firing holes in it, which suggests that it dated from very early in the 1800s or late 1700s, and it was a creek cabin. Next to it was a cornfield being still farmed. I was about 14, I began walking to feel something drew me to that place. It was, it was beginning with, of spiritual feelings that Native Americans often have as they go into adolescence. It's their ancestral spirits calling back to them to remember their heritage. This really happens. It is, I'm not the Lone Ranger. That is, almost everybody talk, talks about these things happening when they're a teenager or, or perhaps in their early 20s. I started going over and walking the fields constantly, and every time I went over there, I found arrowhead or t tools or pottery and developed quite a collection over the two years 
that I spent a lot of time walking that field. But then I entered varsity football, uh, discovered girls, had a driver's license, was a drummer in a rock band. And so I went on to other things and forgot my heritage and did the things that a teenage guy normally does. However, at age 16, I had a special gift given to me as an opportunity. Our new minister was the Reverend Paul Harville. He was from Southwest Georgia, from near Americas. He had been an archeologist before he was a Methodist minister. He had worked in Peru, among other places. I think he'd worked some places in Georgia and also in the Southwest as a student and as a uh, young archeologist. He noticed immediately there were several young people in our church of, of Creek Indian descent. And in fact, he's the first person ever said, Richard, you're an Indian. I said, well, no one has some Indian, a part of something like that. I don't really know. So no, you're an Indian, both spiritually and by just, you look like a Creek Indian. And he took a special interest in me. He would take us to Creek heritage sites around Georgia and Alabama. Uh, he functioned really as my uncle in the traditional sense of Creek education. It was a great blessing for me to have in his life. And I'll never forget the experience. And I'll and the camaraderie that the rest of us had. It was a group of boys and girls, and it's actually more fun than dating a lot of times because it was a very comfortable, uh, relaxed way to, for guys and gals to get to know each other. Because of his experiences in Peru, and he seemed to know things that I would later find out in recent years, he told me, I'm certain that our Creek ancestors came from somewhere to the south, and he meant to the south beyond Florida. And he, Paul, you're absolutely right all your suspicions and what in later years we've proved that you're right. We move on to sophomore year at Georgia Tech. I noticed during the winter quarter a little note on the bulletin board advertising for a volunteer, no money involved at the time, to use ink pens to draw a site plan on mylar plastic of a archeological site on the Chattahoochee River near Six Flags over Georgia. It was getting a lot of publicity in the Atlanta Constitution and the media, TV media, and I thought it was an interesting opportunity for me. Uh, but the main motivation was the opportunity I was looking for to meet girls. There were only 128 co-eds on the entire Georgia Tech campus, and of those who were interested in guys, all were taken or else married. So my great regret was when I went over to Georgia State to meet Dr. Kelly and then the professors from the Georgia State Archaeology Department, I was more interested in gawking at the co-eds. Uh, and remember, this is the hippie period, so they were quite quite uh, interestingly dressed, let's say. It's, a, it's also the time of the miniskirt. I should have paid closer attention, but I do remember some things that happened. Now, I'm just reminded... Uh, while we were there, uh, they had a wooden table covered with artifacts, and they invited me into the party. You know, uh, they were doing something with the artifacts. And Dr. Kelly said, Richard, would you like to see some artifacts I found along the Chattahoochee River, which I think are from Mexico, or copies of artifacts from Mexico. Now, how about that? You don't hear that these days, that the, those things were found. And in actuality, he had... He mentioned those discoveries in some of his archaeological reports, but they're conveniently forgotten by the current generation of Georgia archaeologists. What I remember, and again, I apologize because I was looking at the girls in the office and in the hallway and whatever, but I remember that these artifacts tend to be small figurines, uh, small bowls, and but most of them were cylindrical seals or square seals that were used to stamp cloth or to stamp pottery or to stamp ink on people's skin for doing tattoos. And they did very much look like something from Mexico. Not what you think of American Indian designs, a typical of what you see in museums. In the 1930s, Dr. Kelly was the chief archeologist for Okmulgee, still today the largest archeological investigation ever in the United States. He founded the Society of American Archeology span he was the director of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Georgia until late 1969. We'll talk about that in a moment. Nationally, if not internationally famous, what an opportunity. To me, to, to do that, he became my mentor for the first stage of my education. 
One of the things I do remember him telling me was that the Swift culture came from the south, and by south he meant like south of the Gulf of Mexico. He had proved that because the oldest known Swift Creek pottery was dated from 100 AD and was found at the Manville site on the lower Chattahoochee River. Uh, the Swift culture, Swift Creek culture, spread outward from that town to the north, the south, and the east, and the west. Now, so what I'm saying is it did not come from Florida because the Florida Swift Creek was much younger than Georgia Swift Creek. This puzzled Dr. Kelly, but in my own research, I realized what happened is the Swift Creek culture is from eastern Peru. Uh, the style pottery made there is associated with the Panoan peoples, and we carry Panoan DNA. And before that, it was associated with the earliest known advanced culture of the Polynesians. You can find Swift Creek pottery, something very close to it, much, much older in Western Pacific Basin. Also, Dr. Kelly found a stone building of the ruins of one uh, and in artifacts around it that seem to come from the Chantel Mayas Tabasco state. This all in the general vicinity of the Atapulcate Mines, which if you recall seven years ago, the, the program on the History Channel, is a 100% match of the Atapulcate Mines in Georgia and the Maya Blue Stucco used at the Maya capital city of Palenque. However, Arthur Kelly's discoveries then, as they are now, are completely ignored by his peers. Okay, how this gets involved with me is that the project involved me going out on weekends to make measurements of the, uh, the site. They were just finishing up excavating a town that dated from 400 BC to roughly 250 BC, definitely. But I, I strongly suspect the town lasted much longer, but it, the upper levels have been destroyed by plowing. It was kind of funny because I uh, was a Navy midshipman, you know, worked all the time when I was in school, a pretty straight, squeaky clean to the point of being boringly naive. And they assigned a, a lassie from Georgia State who was a uh, pothead, for lack of a better term. Uh, she stayed stoned the whole time, was giddy, funny, uh, Told, thought I was a, a creature from another planet because I was so straight, but anyway, it was an interesting experience. She'd hold the tape for me while I write down the, the measurements. But what happened was that later on when I was finished my work for him, first of all, he gave me $25, which today would be the equivalent of roughly $175. No, actually more than that then, uh, maybe uh, $200. So, yeah, $25 would be $200 now from 1969. So, really, I got paid pretty fairly for what I did. Also got to meet some wild and crazy, funky girls. Then, in June, I got a call from Dr. Kelly, a long-distance call. He was at a convention or something out of town, and said he had gotten a call from the construction foreman from the industrial park site. They were going to bulldoze this archaeological site to make it part of a... A uh, large industrial park. The developer was the Great Southwest Corporation, which was associated with the people who developed Six Flags over Georgia. However, uh, there had been a flood on Utoy Creek and it exposed an area where the foreman had seen lots of pottery and, what, and artifacts uh, of stone, and he claimed to see bones. But Dr. Kelly didn't believe him, but he asked me to go out there and, and take friend Susan Muse, who was a uh, friend of mine from high school and also was in our group from our church who went out to uh, Creek site. She was part Creek herself and her family had a track of land in West Georgia that had stone runs on it. We immediately saw the bones. That was for real. What we discovered was a burial mound containing pots filled with the ashes of human beings. It's charcoal and bones. So we stopped. We knew we were not supposed to do anything just leave it alone and photographic. Uh, he wanted to make a stone boat of whatever that is, but or not a stone boat, a, a uh, posture boat. But I still don't know what a posture boat is, but we stopped. And as we were about to leave, we noticed a guy drive into the site, go straight to the mound, unlock the gate, and push something into the side of the mound. And on his way out, he saw my car and Susan's car and came rushing over to us and cussed us out 
call us uh, nothing but common pot diggers and grave robbers. And I said, no, actually, you're not supposed to be here. Uh, Dr. Kelly asked us to come here to get samples on the surface of what the water exposed. And he said, well, I'm going to call the cops right now. And I said, you do that. And I'll, and I'll have them call Dr. Kelly. I have his number where he's staying. And you can explain why you're on the property when you're not supposed to be there by order of the Great Southwest Corporation. So he grumbled and went driving off. <clears throat> the next morning, he pretended to find a stone hoe inside the mound on the first day of digging the mound. He then announced it to the papers that he had proof that it was a, a permanent town that's based on agriculture, which would make it the oldest known permanent town, oldest known agriculture in North America at that time. Then, very officially, two days later, a delegation of professors from the University of Georgia suddenly knew exactly where that particular stone hoe was without ever seeing the stone hoe. It was based on a black and white picture, grainy photo in the Atlanta Journal of Constitution. They knew which stone hoe it was and where it came from, and they said it had been stolen and that Dr. Pelly should be arrested and fired from the university for stealing a hoe and committing archaeological fraud. Well, of course, Susan and I were witnesses of what actually happened, so we both called up the Athens police and uh, told them what we'd seen. That cleared Dr. Kelly and saved him a great deal of embarrassment, but nevertheless, he was pressured out and forced to retire from the Department of Anthropology. And for the rest of his life, he was somewhat of a, uh, a uh, pariah in Georgia, although he still had a good reputation elsewhere in the world. But a year later, actually six months later, six months later, it was January 1st when I submitted the proposal, he uh, endorsed my proposal to be a recipient of the first Barrett Fellowship which, in fact, I was not eligible for, but it was supposed to be for graduate students. And I think the fact a man of his stature endorsed me enabled the faculty committee to override their own rules and award the, the grant to me. I uh, was given $1,000, which today is the equivalent of around $7,000 to $8,000, which is a lot of money to spend in three months in Mexico. So you can imagine I did a lot of traveling, did a lot of things that normally a student would be able to do today. I saw all of the archaeological sites of significance throughout Mexico and Central America. So the whole string of events was seen to be planned by the Master of Life, and that's why I'm including the story of the revival of the Creek people. I was on a track, and I didn't know why I was going on that track. You can get the full story from my series of articles on Teotihuacan, but it's relevant here that it seems to be the Master of Breath was guiding individuals to lead. And you'll see the story of several other men who became great leaders in the early revival of the Creek people. Some of you might like President Nixon. He's a rather unpopular president these days, but he was a complex man. He had some many good parts to him. It's just a shame we were not trapped in Vietnam at the time because that's where he really got into trouble. But on June 8, 1970, President Nixon, in a congressional message, officially supported Native Americans' right to self-governance and sovereignty. Here's this, this excerpt of what he said to Congress. The first Americans, the Indians, are the most deprived and most isolated minority group in our nation. On virtually every scale of measurement employment, income, education, health, the condition of the Indian people ranks at the bottom. This condition is the heritage of centuries of injustice. From the time of their first contact of European settlers, the American Indians have been oppressed and brutalized, deprived of their ancestral lands, and denied the opportunity to control their own destiny. Even the federal programs which are intended to meet their needs have frequently proved to be ineffective and demeaning, to say the least. Did you know that Richard Nixon was the first U.S. president to acknowledge his Native American ancestry? That's one of the many, many facts that are today left out of the history book. We only hear the bad parts about President Nixon these days. But something else happened on June 1970. On June 21st, 1970, the Green Corn Festival in summer solstice, I was on an Eastern Airlines jet headed to Mexico City for the experience of a lifetime. Soon after being inaugurated 
Governor George in January 1971, Jimmy Carter pressured the General Assembly to remove all laws discriminatory of Native Americans. You can see that there's a uh, there's a steamroll effect going on during the exact time that I was sent on a fellowship to Mexico. It was happening right then. He also presented legislation to enable state recognition of Native American tribes. Two Georgians of Native American descent, Karen Griffin of Hawkinsville and myself, were chosen to serve as in the Governor Carter's first group of college student interns. Karen later married Chip Carter, but divorced him in 1979. In our family records, we notice that on many occasions, the people left the Savannah River Basin and went to other areas of Georgia, South Carolina to find spouses. That's because it was taboo among Creeks to marry someone you're closely related to. And you were related to everybody after 200 years on the Savannah River. So often they'd go to Hawkinsville. So I'm always wondered, I, I, I like Karen I instantly when I met her, uh, but perhaps we were distant cousins because I know that on several occasions, Creeks or Yuchis came from Henderson, from uh, Hawkinsville to the Savannah to marry my relatives or my relatives went to Hawkinsville to marry people. So there was some crossbreeding going on there along. Turns out that Iron Eagles Cody was 100% Sicilian friend from New Orleans, but in his heart, Jimmy Carter was thought he was doing right. Oops. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, but that was the times. I wanted to show you what it was like back then. I think things were changing quickly, and there were leaders who were trying to do the right thing, but, you know, Iron Eyes Cody was a fake, uh, but then the spokesman for all Indians, Jimmy Carter, was actually considered deeply about Native Americans, but he didn't quite know anything about our heritage at the time. The Creek Nation east of Mississippi merged to a more formal alliance, although in reality there were only a handful of active members. It was mainly the leaders, and this is what's important. As I mentioned earlier, I, like I was being trained, I was put on a path to learn facts and information that I would use in the 21st century, where there were other people uh, these gentlemen who are about 20 to 30 years older than me who were becoming the new leaders they were, that, that forgot about the actual resurrection of the Creek people both in the southeast and in Oklahoma. There were three chiefs, Neil McCormick from Georgia, Wesley Thumbly from Florida, and Houston McGee from Alabama. Now Calvin McGee was also involved in that, his brother, I guess, or his son. They signed a unity agreement in February 1973. This would give an opportunity for each state to work with the legislature to amend the laws of their state and work towards federalization as one tribe, Creek Nation, east of the Mississippi. They, and then later I, tried to make contact with Oklahoma Creeks to form a national Creek tribe. That was always our dream. The block to all that were the Creeks in Oklahoma are still bitter about the Trail of Tears and considered as traitors. They actually considered the Seminoles of Florida to be traitors also, but because they didn't go on the Trail of Tears. But in my case, uh, they're the guilty party, not me. Immediately after the American Revolution, a son of a Tory became principal chief of the Creek tribe. He imagine he made himself Alexander McGilvery. He made himself principal chief. That's kind of like he is. And he was a Tory, and he sought to get revenge on the Eastern Creeks in Georgia who were patriots and had been rewarded for their loyalty to the United States. And so he repeatedly dispatched war parties to attack the Creek, Uchi, and white settlers in Northeast Georgia. He made, they made no difference, and they could treat us just as badly as they did the whites. And so the Creeks in our area dropped out any connection with the Creek Confederacy and went their own way from that point on. So they were not traitors. They're responding to being betrayed by their Creek brothers. Land for Tom and Town was acquired by the McCormicks, he and his wife Peggy, near Wiggum, Georgia, in a deep south steam corner of the state. In 1973, Governor Jimmy Carter signed a proclamation recognizing Tom and Town as a Creek reservation. 
a large sokopah in our our language or chukopah in muskogee or a rotunda was constructed by vista volunteers for ceremonies the tribe celebrated a massive green corn festival in the summer of 1978 and i was there along with my whole family and we were con we were confused we looked nothing like the mccormick's in fact we looked did not look like anything like most of the people there from Alabama or the southwestern tip of Georgia, but we looked like kissing cousins of the delegation that came up from the Seminoles. And that's when I began to learn that there was more to the story of the Creeks than even the Creeks knew. That that's why we were not we did not consider the Muscogees to be Creeks, is that we had a different heritage, a different ancestry, and that most of the Seminoles came from the same part of Georgia where my mother grew up. Neil McCormick was inventor of the electric steel guitar. I bet you didn't know that, did you? And, and the first principal chief of the Tama tribal town. You can see the stage is life here on the far left playing his guitar uh, with the Hank Williams band. In the middle, he meets with Jimmy Carter wearing an authentic Plains Indians or Sioux Indian outfit complete with war bonnet. And then by the, the golden time in his life, he was dressed appropriately as a Creek leader. During that time, I befriended Chief McCormick, became good buddies, in fact. Um, he gave me the name Mountain Lion as my Creek name. Uh, we were in close contact with with the Carter administration. Remember, I was an intern of his in his first class, and you know the first your first intern, as you remember the most, and was guest at social events at the governor's mansion afterwards. So some of the interns went with Carter to Washington in '76, and we cooked up an idea for a creek reservation in North Georgia in an area that the National Park Service and Georgia officials were proposing as a wilderness area. It's along Talking Rock Creek, which flows out of the low hills of the Blue Ridge Mountains near Jasper, Georgia, then flows northwestward and joins the, the Kusawati River at Carter's Lake. And the, the place where it joins the Kusawati was the location of the great town of Kusa, which was stayed in for several weeks by Hernando de Soto. The game plan was for Kusa to be preserved as a national historic site or monument. The North Georgia Creek Reservation be placed in the bottom lands immediately to the east and southeast of Kusa, where we could maintain and protect the, the mound sites at the lower Carter's Lake Reservoir. And then the remainder of the wilderness area, as you see here, where it twists and along canyons and ravines, to be a national wilderness area open to the public and, and the creeks would furnish the guides for canoe trips down the creek or for hiking trips. Now, this is what happened. You wonder, well, why didn't it happen? You always have to have a leader, someone pushing at the local level to make things happen. I've learned that the hard way on too many occasions. But during the fall of 76, I had uh, been switched from working with Native American tribes around the United States, including the Cherokees as a consultant, to being promoted to director of the physical planning department of my company I worked for. And my first assignment of that regard was, was director of the preparation of the comprehensive plan for Charleston, South Carolina, the first comprehensive plan of Charleston, mind you. But there was a problem. I wasn't being paid. The owner of the firm had been dealing with factoring firms for several years in which he would give the factoring firm the contract or the bill that he had sent the client and then he would give be given the money back that he was supposed to get from the client minus an interest deduction from past factoring things. Well, by the time I came along, most of the profit, if not all the profit from the work we were doing was going to pay interest to the factoring firm. And so there was no money left over to pay our salary. And I went about two and a half months like that, you know, the chance of a lifetime to work in Charleston, but not having any money to, to keep up. And I, we were dependent on my wife's income as a teacher, a new wife, and that's not a good way to impress a new wife. 
And, you know, I wasn't eligible for unemployment because I was working. I just wasn't being paid. Um, so by December, I was offered a position as director of the new downtown revitalization program in Asheville and offered a salary that today would be the equivalent of $185,000 a year. So I said yes, and I vomited to Asheville as quickly as I could so I could start earning income. Without me being around, I lost track of what's happening. My understanding was that it soon was changed to the concept of being a Cherokee reservation with a North Carolina Cherokee gambling casino at the site. And when the local residents heard about that, they had a hissy fit. And so they pretty well torpedoed both the wilderness area and having a Native American reservation there. So that's what happened. That's how life really goes these days. But in the meantime, during the late 70s and 80s, the lure of gambling profits destroyed the emerging unity of the Creeks. It killed it, the greed for money. And so what happened is the alliance that began in the early 70s fell apart. The porch ban went alone to go for federal recognition because they wanted to get involved in ownership of gambling casinos. In general, the Creeks in Georgia and Florida did not want to have anything to do with gambling, and so they went their own way. In 1979, for the first time since 1904, the Muscogee people were able to vote in the election of the principal chief and the members of the tribal council. The Muscogee Creek Nation opened a casino in Muscogee, Oklahoma in 1993, and now owns several casinos, and it's a major player in the casino business in Oklahoma. But this is the big surprise. The United States Congress and U.S. Department of Interior recognized the porch ban on August 11, 1984, five years later. Very soon thereafter, the first forms of gambling began occurring on the small reservation owned by the porch ban. Uh, today, they own three gambling casinos in Alabama. They own gambling casinos in several other states that were originally owned by the tribes who did not know how to manage the casinos properly. And they become one of the biggest owners of gambling casinos in the United States, at least as, as an Indian tribe. That was a surprise. There's only like 2,400 members in the porch band. Well, that ends our little delving into the recent past. In chapter three, we will be looking at the published statements made by Southeastern archaeologists and historians concerning the main topic of this booklet, the Mayas in Georgia. What have they written, Peggy? And let's we're going to fact check what they put in writing, and you'll see for the sale how deceptive the situation has been for a long, long time. There has to be some anthropologists and archaeologists that know the truth, but they're far, far hard to find a way to get them to speak the truth in public.